our future two or three generations uh, will be uh, top 5%. And these are Angus sired calves. They'll be top 5% for yearling weight and about the 50th percentile for yearling weight. So in Angus CPDs, that's actually 50 and below. So actually we're using sires that are from about 80 to 100 yearling weight EPD. And then uh, let's see, they would be from 155 to 170 yearling weight EPD is the, the high group. So trying to spread that and still use bulls that are you know kind of reasonable within the industry. We don't think anybody's going to go back to the 1950 or 60s genetics of you know yearling weight EPDs of 50 or 60 pounds. So, so that's going to be interesting to track. Again, we will our research program will be tracking those females as they as they mature and figure out it. You know if there's uh, more specifically if there's uh, considerable cost to the continued aggressive selection for growth in the industry. And then Dr. Beck, of course, is just going to track them to see if the genetic values are, are relatively close. If some of these more moderate growth cattle actually have really good feed efficiency uh, because our, you know, the EPDs that we have right now reflect that, uh, you know, that efficiency value, which Angus uses residual average daily gain as their efficiency number. Uh, but it, it tracks, it's highly, highly correlated to growth. So if you're a moderate growth sire, basically suggests that there's not very good efficiency there. And we think there's probably some, you know, some genetics that are actually moderate growth and extremely efficient in the feed yard. But uh, we hope to learn a lot more about that. So um, Ali asked me to talk about nutrition uh, going this time of year, going forward. I thought maybe we'd just spend our time uh, talking about some of the principles of uh, mineral nutrition, uh, kind of go over those fundamentals and then show you if we can get it to blow up alley big enough for everybody to see uh, the, the numbers. So we're going to, I'm going to try to use calculator to demonstrate to you how you can relatively easily without having to do a whole lot of of background research or homework. I think you can conduct your own uh, mineral nutrition survey in your operation. And we'll, we'll talk more about that. But let me just jump into just a few things about uh, the fundamentals. Uh, these, most of this information comes right out of our master cattlemen program. So a lot of you all have, have uh, seen this information, but let's just talk about the big picture in terms of minerals. First of all, I'd say this is one of the most confusing areas of beef cattle production, in my opinion. Uh, it's because there's so many moving parts. You know, the cow's nutritional requirements change nearly every day because she cycles through the production cycle. And, you know, lactation is never the same. It's always either increasing or decreasing. Um, uh, that fetus is always growing or she's dry. And, and, uh, and, and the fetus is small, so on and so forth. Um, and then you have the, the, you know, when you switch pastures, their mineral composition of their diet changes. Uh, when you switch mineral products, the mineral composition of their diet changes. When you begin to supplement a concentrate, so on and so forth. So it can get, it can get complicated. And there, there are literally thousands of products on the market with different mineral forms and different formulations and so on. So, uh, you know, I think it's helpful every now and then just to revisit the fundamentals. And that'll help give you some confidence in your mineral nutrition decisions. Uh, so here we got, uh, you know, the, the things that are really important about an adequate mineral nutrition program. Everybody I think knows, recognizes, or at least assumes that. Uh, you know, here's the, uh, I, I had, this is one slide I forgot to update the other day, but uh, I think this, this guy, anybody know about what they're spending on their mineral program right now, annually? $80 is probably at the low end at this point. Anybody have a, a guess what that might be? No takers? Well, uh, it, uh, I mean, obviously, it's an important expense and that, like everything else, it's gone up here, uh, certainly recently. 
Okay, but here's here's the one thing that I think a lot of people ignore uh, because it's just difficult to track and document. And that is, you know, when you have an animal that is in relatively has been relatively well managed in terms of a balanced mineral nutrition program, and then you go buy you go purchase some product that is just loaded with one element or several that the cow really doesn't need, uh, it leads, it can lead to more antagonisms, imbalances, and in fact, reduce performance. And that is particularly true for things like selenium, copper, and zinc. Okay, you can definitely overdo these. And I think we have quite a few cases, probably more in seed stock operations where, you know, they try to, uh, buy all the insurance they can basically in terms of nutrition so they're because they fear reproductive failure or whatever and want their animals to uh, perform at their maximum genetic capacity but i think in a lot of cases we probably get where we actually overdo it and and things may go backwards so this exercise i think is important i'm just going to move on here to a uh, Real nice older data set. Again, you've probably seen this. So this is two data sets combined. Keith Lesby and others were involved in gathering a lot of data across the state of Oklahoma. So let me just share this with you real quick. Uh, it gives you some fundamental principles about Oklahoma forage mineral composition. Now, all of these samples were collected in, in uh, early to midsummer. Most of it came from hay samples, some of it from hand plucked samples out in the pasture, but a good deal of this came from hay samples. So, from a timing standpoint, just keep in mind these are mid, basically midsummer uh, forage mineral concentrations. All right, so we'll start out with sodium, uh, salt, sodium chloride is uh, not quite uh, 50%, it's a little under 50% sodium, okay? So uh, sodium is extremely important in terms of the animal's central nervous system. It's, it's basically the element that creates those uh, um, electrical uh, signals at the synapses of, of neurons, and so it's really important. Here you can see, not too many of us have alfalfa and clover here in Oklahoma. I guess you would have more down there uh, in uh, Grady County, but uh, you can see that in terms of on average, sodium concentration in most of our forages is well below the animal's requirement. And this is the fundamental principle why cattle love salt, okay? It's, and they do seem to have nutritional wisdom when they're short on sodium. Uh, now, you know, obviously they'll, they actually most of the time over consume salt to compensate for this, but there you see why native range is, is particularly low, fescue is low in sodium and Bermuda grass on average is also about 30% below the animal's requirement. That black rectangle there represents the range of requirement from growing animals all the way up to uh, lactating cows and mature bulls. So there's sodium. Uh, this is phosphorus. In this uh, Oklahoma uh, combined data set, uh, you can see that native range or native pasture, prairie hay, uh, is going to be the one that we're most concerned about in terms of pot potentially getting uh, low or animals getting deficient in phosphorus. Uh, not so much an issue in Bermuda grass. Uh, we've got some data in our late harvested Bermuda grass where it is deficient. Uh, and I'm sure you would find that occasionally as well. And just like Allie and others uh, tell, you know, mention all the time, this is average data. It was collected several years ago. So, you know, the obvious thing for you to do is to sample your own forage and have your own values to use because uh, these are probably going to vary by species and could even value significantly by field or pasture. Uh, but uh, on average, uh, again, the legumes are pretty good source of phosphorus. Uh, Bermuda grass is moderate. On average, is going to be about at the animal's requirement, maybe a little above. 
we're going to get concerned, especially in mid late summer, all winter long, about native pasture and phosphorus supplementation because they're going to need it. Okay, here's AMBLE's requirement for phosphorus or copper. Uh, still, the National Research Council still says it's approximately 10 parts per million. Uh, the requirement for all uh, ages of cattle and and most of our grasses are, are marginal to low in copper. So you are going to need some copper supplement, whether that comes in your range cubes or whether it comes in free choice mineral. It's a good idea to bolster this with to your, your program with copper. Hopefully the product that you purchase uh, covers us well, and we'll take a look at that here right quick. Uh, legumes, again, are a much better source of this trace mineral compared to the grass species we have here in Oklahoma. Zinc, same story. The only difference is this is the only mineral that the legumes are a little shy on um, and very similar to all the grass species, short on zinc. So your, your supplementation program needs to provide some supplemental zinc. Okay, now manganese is a controversial one. Uh, you see the requirement there is actually below uh, at least this data set that was collected. Um, and it would appear that Bermuda grass and native have adequate manganese. Now, there's some still some disagreement in terms of the availability of manganese in our uh, grass species. And so a lot of mineral nutritionists, mineral companies argue that you still need to supplements about double the requirement in manganese because of that, you know, sort of unknown uh, digestibility or availability of manganese and forage. I'm not sure why we haven't gotten that resolved yet after all these years, but uh, that is still the case. The nice thing is, if you do supplement too much manganese, A, it doesn't cost very much, and B, it doesn't create a lot of antagonisms. Manganese is, uh, is pretty easy to get along with. In other words, compared to copper, zinc, sulfur, iron, and some of the others that are serious antagonists. Okay, last one, selenium. <clears throat> uh, it turns out on average, uh, our forages are really, our grass species are really pretty, pretty decent sources for selenium. Um, you can see here again that the uh, legumes are an excellent source of selenium most of the time. Um, but uh, other than fescue, in general, selenium is going to be uh, adequate or a little bit above the requirement. Uh, they're not a tremendous amount of antagonists to tie up selenium. <clears throat> and so, you know, I think we kind of have to be careful because a lot of the products on the market are, are uh, formulated to contain the Food and Drug Administration maximum allowable selenium composition. And it might not be, in many cases, it may not be, probably is not uh, necessary. Nope, I said that was the last one. Here's iron. And as you know, you know, we live in the land of iron oxide, right? Red dirt, Oklahoma. Uh, iron and potassium both are almost always excessive in all of our forage sources. I have not seen one yet that is not adequate in iron composition. Um, and, and certainly... You know, what this tells me is that you need to seek uh, mineral products that are not loaded with iron, right? Because we already have far more than, than we need. Iron uh, is an antagonist to copper and zinc absorption. And so, you know, overdoing iron uh, just makes, makes those other issues more of a problem. Uh, so... That's the main thing. So what, uh, just curious uh, for your quiz this morning, what makes uh, commercial mineral product red? Allie, maybe Allie, you're gonna have to offer up a new Dodge pickup or something for the winter for me to get a response. Uh, 
So we already given us riding gauges. What it, what is it that makes red mineral commercial mineral products red? Probably well, iron. Uh, iron oxide, right? That that's generally it's not food coloring. It's generally iron oxide, and so. You know, I would just pay attention, especially if it has a red color to it, find out. And you can ask if it's not on the feed tag and iron, eh, usually, I guess it usually is on the feed tag, but uh, you can, if, if um, you can ask your supplier, your salesman or whatever to see the company formulation for this. And generally they will provide it for you. Uh, to show you exactly what that content is. If it's loaded with iron, it might be one to pass on. Okay, so now with that in mind, what I think I'd like to do next is uh, pull up our calculator program and let's just go through some examples of how you can actually track this and clear up uh, some potential confusion in terms of mineral supplementation. <coughs> Uh, and this is what I call a, just a simple mineral survey. Uh, what I think, you know, would be handy if you have enough cattle and you're concerned enough about mineral nutrition, number one, the easy thing to do is to pull a sample on your hay that's harvested and send it into a laboratory. You know, we, I, Allie, do you remember we charge here? At our lab on campus, uh, I believe it's $12 per sample for mineral analysis. Does that sound right? I don't know. You remember? Haven't done it in all. <laughs> Haven't done it? Okay. Well, it's something like that. And, it, and, and bottom line is it just does not cost very much. And you get a pretty good range of trace minerals and, and macro minerals uh, for that. I believe it's $12. Um, the other thing you could do, though, uh, if you're interested in tracking it year round uh, and seeing, you know, uh, if there's different times of the year when you need to modify your program a little bit or something, you know, you could do it uh, during, you could take uh, hand pluck samples out there in the pasture, uh, just collecting the, 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 forage or the species, the plant parts that you think the animals are primarily grazing. It's not going to be perfect. We don't recommend clipping it all the way to the ground because there's going to be some stems and so on there that the cattle just aren't consuming. I think a hand pluck sample out in a pasture is about as good as we're going to do and it's relatively simple, especially if you spend some time kind of observing what the cattle are grazing. But if you do, you know, you can sample your hay. And then if you do a growing season sampling, I mean, that gives you much better information than 95% of the cattle producers in the country have. Now, you, if you're really passionate about it or you trying to identify a specific problem, you know, you might want to do it quarterly or every month. Uh, you might, you know, you may want to do several pastures or do your native grass and your Bermuda grass. I mean, whatever. You, you can decide how much work you want to go to and homework to do these uh, surveys. But then all you have to do is plug the cattle in, whatever cattle you're interested in, their stage of production, describe them from a weight standpoint, how much milk you think they produce, their breed, so on and so forth. And that sort of establishes their estimated requirement. Uh, then we're going to then we're going to put your forage, just type it into this feed list with your mineral values, and then we'll compare one to the other. And we'll see how good a job your current mineral, we'll type in your mineral supplement too, uh, and then give them whatever you, and then we'll indicate that they're, you know, if you think they're eating two ounces, we'll plug two ounces in and see how that looks from a balance standpoint. So let's do that right quick. I've got, uh, so right here, you just, I'm going to start off this time of year, spring calving cow. So we're going to say early lactation, mature cow. Um, we've got uh, 1,200 pound cows here. Okay, woman. Yeah. Can you stop and explain what program you're using real fast? Oh, sure. My bad. So this is uh, our calculator nutrition program. Does everybody have this program? Sorry. 
Okay, I'll send it out in our the email. I'll do this. The link to it. Okay, you're good. You're good. Okay. So yeah, this is just, it's just a glorified Excel spreadsheet. Um, but uh, it it'll do all it does all this math for you pretty quick and and makes it makes it a little easier to do these kind of summaries. Uh, so we've got the calculator program is broken down into a balancer sheet, a feed list, and then a cattle page where you describe the cattle. So we'll start out on that cattle section. Can I, you do the zoom button? Yep. The, yeah. yeah. I've got a great big screen here, so it may be showing up pretty small on yours. Is that getting better? Yes. Yeah. Is that good? Okay. How about okay. that? You, you guys uh, move closer if you need to. Obviously, <laughs> obviously, yeah. See, I got my over 40 glasses on here. Yeah. Um, okay, so 1,200 pound cows. Uh, here you, we've got, and, and milk production does influence their mineral requirement. Right now, I've got them on average milk production. You know, if you've been using bulls with higher milk EPD, you might want to select high, and that bumps their uh, projected uh, daily milk production at, during the early lactation anyway, up to 29 pounds. Uh, you can, if you've been going the other way or, or, you know, you have some indication that they're relatively low from a genetic standpoint, you can, you can modify that. But we'll just leave it on average for now. I'm going to say these cows are starting out a body condition score five at the end of this feeding period. I've got a 100-day feeding period in here. So we start today on May 3rd. Um, we want them to wind up 100 days from now and, and maintain their body condition score five. Okay, and then you select the breed. I've got them in here at 100% Angus. That's about all there is to it. Um, now we've kind of described what these animals' requirements should be. Uh, from an energy of protein standpoint, uh, and so on. Okay, now, here's our feed list. I've just clicked here on the, on the feed list tab, and I can go in here and type in anything. Uh, you, so you can, you can type in your hay harvested this year and fill in these blanks with your own values if you have it tested. And that's, that's the real value. Down here in the minerals, vitamins and minerals section, I've just got a few um, minerals entered. This is our own custom mineral mix. This is a very common uh, core tetracycline mineral. How many of you are feeding uh, CTC products still? Yes. Yes? I can't. I can't. You, you're looking pretty small on my screen there, but. Okay, so anyway, th this would be a relatively common uh, mineral product that a lot of folks are, are using or something very similar. This is actually a bluebird formulation, meaning that it's the only one the FDA approves. So most of these CDC, CTC products are very similar uh, because it's the only one cleared. Well, let's just start off here and we'll build a program with these cows considering that you've got them kicked out on this fresh spring forage to take a quick look at that. So I'm gonna say graze forages. Uh, let's start with a native pasture. We'll use springtime forage. Uh, I'm gonna, I'll stick them in here at about now. Remember that this is on an as fed basis. And so it's gonna look really high. <laughs> I plugged in 80 pounds. Um, can you zoom in again, Dr. Walden? Can I do what? Zoom in again. Oh, right. did I? Oh, yep. Yeah, switch pages and it didn't. Better? Yep. Okay. So this is, I don't remember. It's about, I think it's about 60% moisture. Uh, so I've got it in there. I'm going to. Put it in real high. Now I've got to type in my feed intake on an as fed base. I have to do this twice. Uh, so I'm going to type, just type in 80 pounds there. Okay. And it says the first thing you want to do is just look at your feed intake ratio. We try to get that close to one. Okay. So actually, I got lucky. I'm pretty close to about what the program thinks these cows will consume in a day. 
80 pounds of as-fed forage in the springtime is equivalent of 32 pounds of forage dry matter. Everybody follow me there? So that's what it thinks these cows will consume. I'm real close to one here, meaning, I've, meaning these two numbers are almost the same. Uh, it's saying it predicting they'll consume about another four tenths of a pound. Uh, and then we can go over here. This is our uh, nutrient composition table. Maybe you guys out of the way here. Um, and you can see here we've got a diet dry matter that's only 40% because there's all that moisture in spring forage. And I think the real value from a mineral standpoint in doing something like this is that you can look right here on daily amount and you can see the requirement and the dry matter amount supplied. Now in the past, this has been really hard to come by, but with these new programs, uh, it really clarifies this. So let's go down here and let's just start off with calcium. Now it says with that forage, uh, native range that I've, we've got typed in there. Again, you'd want your own values in here, but for what I've got in there, an average value, it's saying that these cattle require about 43 grams a day. Well, if they eat that much of this forage, they're getting 48. So it's indicating that calcium balance is adequate in this case. Okay, and remember, these cows are producing milk, and you know there's a lot of calcium in milk. Uh, so uh, still not suggesting we need a bunch of additional calcium supplement. Phosphorus, on the other hand, is already, even this time of year, deficient. It's indicating that we've got typed into the feed list that this particular forage on a dry matter basis is in at 0.17. It says, well, as a percent of diet, you, you need 0.19. In other words, they need 28 grams. They're only getting 25. So we're not too far off. We're pretty close here. We just need a little bit more phosphorus to fix that slight gap. You might not ever even notice if it were cattle were on here for 100 days, that marginal of a deficiency, you may never notice it. Uh, but anyway. Uh, so, okay, so here is sodium. This is the salt issue. Uh, you can see the requirement is about 15 grams. They're only getting three. So you can see why cattle, in partic particularly this time of year, from now until about the first to middle of July, cattle eat a lot of mineral. And this is generally why, uh, because they're eating so much forage, it's really low in sodium. So it's saying they need a diet that's 0.1%. They're getting a diet that's 0.02%. Potassium, as I mentioned earlier, way overshooting their requirement. They're getting 232 grams. They only need 102. So we're doubled up plus on potassium. We definitely don't want to go spend a bunch of money and load up their diet with more potassium. Magnesium, uh, saying it's adequate. Sulfur, adequate. Cobalt, right at the requirement, just a little bit above, but it's saying that this forage source is about adequate. Uh, copper, adequate this time of year, but look at that, just barely, right? I've got it in there at 10 parts per million. It says the requirements is, are 10 parts per million. So if you do your analysis on your own spring forage and it comes in at seven, you know, that means you're going to be deficient. If it comes in at 15, you're going to be in great shape and maybe overfeeding copper without even providing a mineral supplement. Here's the big, uh, the big problem we have with iron, right? Huge over, uh, oversupply of iron. And this is what creates some antagonisms and ties up copper and so forth. So that is a challenge, especially you know, on, uh, on the high iron soils that we have in much of this state. Okay, uh, manganese says we're adequate there. Selenium, adequate. Wouldn't want to go, we're, we're nearly doubled up on the amount of selenium we need this time of year. 
wouldn't make a lot of sense to go buy a high selenium mineral product to make that even more uh, of a, of a uh, problem. Uh, and then zinc, we're slightly deficient, like I showed you in the PowerPoint graph. Um, now, one thing I guess I should mention is that these requirements here uh, for these minerals, the National Research Council, when they establish these requirements for cattle, they considered the average digestibility and absorption of each mineral and generally from common feeds that uh, the industry uses. So I don't remember the numbers for each one of these. It doesn't make a whole lot of difference. I ju you just need to know that they've already considered digestibility. So let's take phosphorus, for example. And I imagine the number is somewhere between 60 and 70% of dietary phosphorus is assumed to be available for digestion, 60 to 70%. Now, again, I don't remember exactly what the number is. We can go to the beef cattle manual and look it up because it's in there, uh, but, uh, but it's somewhere in that range. So digestibility, availability are built in to these requirements, okay? That's important for people to understand. You know, don't let somebody try to sell you some product uh, because one mineral or another is not very digestible. Well, if it isn't, it's already in, incorporated into that requirement. Okay, so now we need to got a little, few little deficiencies here. Let's see if we can fix it right quick. Uh, I'm going to use, uh, I've got minerals, so I just selected here um, the minerals and vitamins category from the feed list. Then I can go in there and pick exactly what product I want from that section of the feed list. And I'm just gonna slide down here to that Sweet Licks uh, CTC product. I'm not trying to promote that. It's just one I've got entered there and it's easy to use. So let's just say uh, we're gonna have these cattle consume, I don't know, somewhere around maybe two and a half to three ounces a day. So in this is pounds of ASFED. So uh, let's see, what is, Allie, on your phone, divide, let's start with three ounces divided by 16 ounces in a pound. What percent is that? Or how many pounds is that? It's going to be about 0.15 or 0.2. Let's see how fast she is with her phone. It's 0.5. How much? Three divided by 16. Three divided by 16. Yeah, three ounces divided by 16 ounces. Maybe I'm not hearing you. Did you say 0. 0.5? No, it was 0. 0.18. 0. 0.18? Oh, no, that sounds know. better. Half of 16 is point is eight ounces. So yeah. Yeah, yeah that makes that makes sense. Okay, 0. 0.18. Thank you. Um, all right. So now we've got uh 32 pounds of forage dry matter intake. We've got about a almost 0.2 pounds of mineral intake a day, three ounces. We slip over here. Huh, interesting. It looked like it, uh, still saying we're a little bit deficient in sodium. We need 15 grams. We're only getting 9.3 grams, but we definitely fixed the copper. See, we went from 146, I don't remember exactly what we were at, but we're about 50, nearly 50 grams over the requirement now in copper. Uh, we actually made our uh, selenium imbalance just a little bit higher, uh, and zinc were well over the requirement. We could actually, you know, we could probably actually reduce this. Looks like we need to feed a little salt though, doesn't it? Because we're deficient in, in sodium still. Those cattle are probably going to... Uh, consume some salt. So let's just go get some sodium chloride. And let's say we mix sodium chloride in our, with our mineral uh, about, I don't know, uh, 10 to 20% sodium chloride. So 0.18, I'll do my own math here this time. 0.18 times 1.2. 0 0.216 or 0 0.0, we're going to put in about 0.03, that'd be about 20% approximately. 
0.036 would be 20%, I guess. All right, so that fixed our salt deficiency. We're a little bit above now, just barely above what they need in salt. You can see right there. And for whatever reason, that's interesting. Um, we're right on the money, 21.9 on sulfur in both, and it's it's flagging, flagging it as deficient. But I don't think I'd be worried about, about that. You know, the math in here occasionally is gonna give you a flag when when it's really, really close. Probably if you look at another decimal point or two out, uh, the requirement's just a tick higher than what we're supplying. Okay, so basically that's how you can uh, arrive uh, just, just by putting in those values of your mineral supplement, your forage source and the stage of production and the, describe the details of your cattle you can do a mineral balance survey like this pretty quick. And, uh, and it's not that difficult if you just do a little bit of homework and gathering up, you know, some forage values. Uh, just real quick, one last thing, and then we'll see if there's any questions. Let's just change this to Bermuda grass this time of year. Uh, and just see how it looks, how different it is. So we're reasonably well balanced here. Can't do much about the potassium or the iron excess. We do have a selenium excess with that particular mineral, uh, commercial mineral product. Let's switch to Bermuda grass. Say vegetative Bermuda. Okay, so first thing it's telling us is that they'll eat more of this. Um, the TDN is 64%. I think the native, as I recall, was 66, perhaps. Um, so it looks like we need to increase. Oh, I'll bet my, oh, I know what's going on. My dry matter value for the Bermuda is substantially different than the native, but that's probably what it is. So let me just play around with this and I'll just put in total feed intake until I get up to close to that 1.0. Yeah, definitely my dry, yeah, dry matter content's only 30%. On the native, it was 40%. So that's why it's forcing me to put in a bunch more as fed feed intake. Okay, anyway, I'm back up to 32 pounds of uh, feed intake, uh, it's projecting the cows to gain a little bit of weight. Um, and then we look over here, let's see, let's look at our copper. Uh, we're quite a ways over that requirement again, aren't we? Nearly a hundred grams a day, 10 part per million requirement. We've got 16 parts per million in their current diet. Uh, selenium. Iron, manganese is now considered to be excessive, and our zinc is more than double what we need as well. So we could uh, we could definitely back off on that if the cattle would only eat. A little under two ounces, something like that. We'd actually probably bring these a lot of these closer to in line. Uh, either that or go get a, a mineral product that's not quite as loaded with uh, all of those. But, you know, the challenge is if you're going to, if you're going to feed CTC during the vector season, you don't have a lot of choices. So that's how you can do that. Now we're, you know, we're talking now about, um, uh, high quality forage, we can easily switch this over to hay so you can evaluate this during the, during the winter. Uh, so you just go here, harvested forages, and then you put your own hay value in here. I'll just put, uh, we'll just put in, let's say full bloom Bermuda grass hay, not very good quality hay. I'm gonna have to substantially adjust my as fed feed intake. I just drop it down to, Oop, no wonder I'm gonna have to change this number. Okay, we're pretty close there. There we go. So now we're balanced here. These lactating cows are losing all kinds of weight. 
<laughs> which you would expect. TDN on this hay is only 52%. Um, uh, looks like we're deficient in protein as well. But what we're interested in today is these mineral balances. And there you can see that, uh, you know, they're just not near the mineral concentration in this hay as they're in early season forage. As the plant matures, almost all nutrient concentration declines. And that's what you're seeing here. Uh, so let's go back. Let's just real quick go back up to uh, three ounces a day and see if that helps. And yeah, it does actually. Looks like it pretty well fixes everything. Three ounces a day of that product uh, with hay. And that's, and that's without any concentrate supplement at all. Okay, enough of that. Uh, just thought I'd see, uh, hope, hope maybe this little exercise will give you some ideas on how you can use this to, you know, have a little more confidence in your program uh, based on your cattle, based on your uh, forage resources and, and harvest time, and fertility and all that. So any questions or comments? Question about the phosphorus and iron. Uh, a while back, most of the commercial minerals you get seemed like they were up around 12% phosphorus. Now a lot of them have dropped down to 8%, even 6% in some cases. I suppose mainly just to uh, control the cost, keep the cost down. Is that uh, six, eight percent going to be adequate, or do we need to look at twelve percent? I, you know, so this one, sweet licks. Uh, I tell you what, we can find out right quick here. Let me just delete the forage and salt. Now you look over here. They're this. Uh, it thinks that the only diet they're getting is that mineral, <laughs> but we can look at the percentages, right? So let's see. Phosphorus in this sweet licks product, Harold is nine and a half percent. Sodium is eight, but remember salt is about half sodium, half chloride. It's not quite that, but anyway, so sodium or salt in this mix is about 16%, double the sodium. Phosphorus is nine and a half. Uh, I think uh, actually the feed industry has come around. We used to, uh, there were a lot of 12, 12, 12 products on the market which is 12% calcium, 12% phosphorus, and 12% salt. Um, and we were overfeeding, pro uh, we're overfeeding phosphorus in a lot of cases, especially when you're feeding three, four, five, six pounds of an oilseed meal-based uh, winter concentrate supplement, dried distillers, grains, corn gluten feed, all really high in phosphorus. And so, then you throw in a 12% phosphorus mineral. And if the cattle consume two and a half, three, three and a half, four ounces a day, you're <clears throat> overfeeding phosphorus. So Harold, I think now that's not to say that there won't be some situations where that 12% phosphorus is needed. There'll probably still be a few. Rarely will a 12% phosphorus be needed in the springtime anywhere in the state of Oklahoma, just because our spring forages have generally adequate adequate phosphorus content. Any other questions or comments? David, if you, if you were in a grower lot situation where you're feeding solid, mm -hmm. you need to basically go through the, the steps in the same manner? Yeah, you bet. Uh, I think we got a few minutes here. Sound like Jerry. Talking back there, let me, uh, let me jump back here to cattle. I'll switch this to growing and finishing cattle. What the calves weigh, Jerry? Six. Uh, in weight, 600. We'll take them to 900. Finish weight, 1450. Uh, this doesn't matter too much. You go feed remits in? Yes. Implant, of course. Yes. Okay. Uh, Angus calves. All right. I think that's about all we need. Let's go back to our balancer. We're going to need to get. Are you feeding any hay, Jerry? 
Yeah, there'll be some in the mix. Wow. Well, yeah, come. Solid, solid with some high in. What, 20, 30% hay? Uh, no, I'm like 10. Okay. And then we'll go to our harvested forages. Corn silage. Corn silage. And how much of that? Oh, 70%. Okay, and then some concentrate. Uh, corn distillers. Yeah, corn and uh, whole cop seed. How much of each? Well, let's just say uh, 10 and 10. 10 and 10. The lights come out. Just for your example. Okay, that's 100%. We need to back way off on the feed intake. So here I entered it as a percentage. We're real close to 100 there. So now I need to put in my as fed feed intake. Are you feeding them a limited amount or they get all they want or how are you doing that? All they'll eat. Okay, about how much you think they're eating? Well, probably uh, once it gets on its probably gonna be eating 30 pounds. 30. This says they'll eat about 32, 33. That, that okay? All right. Now we jump over here. Uh, actually, yeah, it says we need just a little bit more protein. We're not terribly deficient, but whoa. Oh, no. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, it's not calculating the dry matter amount. But anyway, we're just slightly deficient protein. Uh, calcium is a little deficient, which is fairly common with uh, some of these, uh, some of these uh, mixed diets. So we need to go get just a little bit more calcium here. Um, you're probably not feeding that CTC product, I don't suppose, of these calves. So I, don't, I may not have anything in my library that'd be similar to what you're putting in there. But yeah, in general, we're going to need a product that's got some calcium. We don't need the phosphorus. Um, obviously, some salt. Uh, it's just actually saying we're, uh, we're real close, though. Look at that. 11 and a half grams to 11 grams, real close on sulfur. And sure don't need a real loaded trace mineral package here. Look how it's saying excessive on Cobalt, adequate copper, excessive iron, manganese, and selenium, adequate on zinc. So, uh, yeah, I, I think you get by in this case with something, you know, you need a little bit more protein, a little bit of calcium, and, and more salt. You can get by on this, on this program with a pretty darn inexpensive minerals product. Okay, thank you. Okay. Everybody have a good day. Enjoy the mud for about a day or two. And uh, wish the best. Hope to see you, uh, if not sooner, maybe Cattlemen's this, this summer. We are going to uh, try to get our next Ranchers Thursday Lunchtime Series uh, out next week. So hopefully you'll be seeing here hearing about that soon. Uh, we've been trying to do one every quarter. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Lawman. I guess there's no OSU Ranch Tour this year, is it? No OSU Ranch Tour. We're going to hit that hard next spring now that we're pretty much through all the COVID restrictions. Uh, back there in uh, April, February, March, and April, uh, it was still unclear as to where we're going to wind up on the COVID restrictions. As it turns out, we probably could have went ahead and and held it without a lot of liability, but uh, not one this year, but we are intending to do that next spring, Harold. Okay, hey, you all have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.